quantum theory and Einstein's general theory of relativity are the two great fundamental theories of contemporary physics. Between them, they provide the conceptual framework and the mathematical language in which we express all other theories in physics. And they provide the basic principles to which all known laws of nature conform. The deeper and more general a theory is, the further away it tends to be from everyday experience. So it's not surprising that our deepest theories involve some very unfamiliar counterintuitive phenomena, not least of which are the phenomena of quantum computation, the subject of these lectures. But in this first lecture, I won't describe any phenomena. I'll give an overview of how quantum theory describes the world and physical processes. And then I'll introduce you to the simplest of all quantum systems, which is also the centerpiece of quantum computation, the qubit or quantum bit. Quantum computation isn't something that existing microchips do, even if they rely on quantum mechanical phenomena. Today's computers don't count as quantum computers because their repertoire of computations is still the same as that of the abstract universal Turing machine, which was the prototype of all classical computers devised by the mathematician Alan Turing in 1936. Quantum computers will be capable of new modes of computation, which classical computers are incapable of, even in principle. The equations that predict the outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments are all uncontroversial. But what the underlying explanation is, what's happening physically to bring about those outcomes, is still very controversial. The various rival explanations are called interpretations of quantum theory. The one I'll be using sounds like science fiction at first, it was proposed by Hugh Everett in 1957, and it's called the Many Universes Interpretation. It says that the universe, the space we see around us with all the galaxies and stars and matter, doesn't constitute the whole of reality. In fact, it's just a small slice of physical reality as a whole, where there are, among other things, vast numbers of coexisting universes similar to ours. If you're new to this idea and skeptical, that's good, but I ask you to go along with it for the purpose of learning the theory. In the course of that, I expect to persuade you that this very fruitful way of understanding quantum theory makes sense. In fact, that it's the only way that makes sense. Anyway, if there are many universes, we need a new word to denote physical reality as a whole. And that word is, instead of universe, multiverse. Our universe, then, is to some approximation a self-contained entity within the multiverse. This approximation is called classical physics, pre-quantum physics. And in computation theory, it's called classical computation. That is to say, Turing-type computation. As we'll see, Turing's theory is a complete model for computations that happen within individual universes. The quantum theory of computation is the full theory, which has the multiverse as its arena. In many physical phenomena, especially on microscopic scales, the classical approximation just breaks down, because in reality, physical objects aren't confined to just one universe. They have a certain extension across the multiverse. Or, to put that in another way, every object in one universe has counterparts in a range of other universes. And these counterparts can behave differently from each other and they can affect each other. Such effects are called quantum interference. 
they constitute our evidence of the existence of a reality beyond our universe. Under certain circumstances, they permit fundamentally new modes of information processing, which we call quantum computation and quantum communication. The theory of computation was originally conceived of as a branch of pure mathematics. It has been incorporated into physics via the quantum theory of computation, which is now the theory of computation. The previous abstract theory developed by Turing and others lives on only as the classical approximation, though, as I said, that's good enough to describe what all computers currently on the market do. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that the theory of computation always did have a lot in common conceptually with physics. When a computer performs a computation, it starts with some input information which it modifies according to definite rules which are characteristic of the hardware of that computer. So the output depends on the input and on the rules by which the computer operates. A physical system is, roughly speaking, some part of nature that could, in principle, be experimented on, such as this. Physical systems undergo motion, or change. In other words, we can pick any two times and say that the system has changed from an initial state to a final state between those two times according to laws of motion, which are the laws of physics as specialized to that system. Experiment and measurement are just forms of motion. They involve both a system we're experimenting on and some measuring instrument or observer. We find the system in an initial state, or we prepare it in some way, and we prepare a measuring instrument. The system and the measuring instrument then interact according to the laws of physics, which makes the measuring instrument display the outcome of the experiment. You can see that everything in the left-hand column here is a special case of the corresponding thing on the right. But you can also think of that the other way around. Any final state contains information about the system's initial state and about what has happened to it since. So the motion of any physical system, because it obeys definite laws, can be regarded as information processing. 